Hi, welcome to Into ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Jamie Redway, and she has never told her near death experience publicly before. And we just happened to get chatting on Facebook about something, and she's seen I do this, and she had this <laughs> and hadn't told it. And so I'm very excited for her to share this with everyone. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me, Peggy. I'm so incre- incredibly excited. I can barely talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, like I told you earlier, um, it was, it's time. It's been two years since the incident, and um, I know I need to talk, speak about it. And God laid it on me a few weeks ago that it was time. So it's, I felt that nudge, and just so divinely um, was connected. Uh, we were connected together, and here I am. <laughs> so, Do you have kids that just come in? Next door. I'm going to close the door. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah, there's five of them. (laughs) Okay. Okay, so go right ahead. Okay, so you just want me to jump right in, right? Uh Okay, well, I won't lead into the incident, what caused me to have the near-death experience, but what happened was um, a friend of mine found me at home just in time and called the ambulance, and I made it to the hospital just in time to be intubated. Um, But... I might as well say what I did. I attempted suicide. I took a full bottle, 100 doses of Benadryl and a full bottle of month's worth worth bottle of Celexa that I had my antidepressant. And I also tried some secondary methods, but I won't get into that. It's kind of gruesome. (laughs) Um, So the only, I don't remember seeing the light. It's, It's, I had a little bit of a different experience. I remember just floating with the stars I was I was with the stars like maybe like in the void or zero point um I remember seeing this orange and I can't really explain the color to you because it's a color I never seen in real life it was I would say between an orange a bright orange coral and I was in the middle of this galaxy and I was like I was everywhere all at once in the galaxy Um, and I was nothing but everything all at once. Um, I felt this incredible, uh, euphoric, loving energy. I felt, I felt no like fear, no pain, no worries. There was nothing negative there. It was all just euphoric. I was, um, would we like to say blissed out? I was blissed out. I was, um, trying to think of uh exuberate like exuberant uh just full of life force energy um it was very serene very peaceful just almost like just floating just a floating sensation just all like everything spread out all at once and there was no denseness to me whatsoever and a friend of mine asked her if I could mention her today. Her name's Jessica. Um, and she had never heard about my NDE. So she had asked me, well, what happened? And I was like, and I told her about the orange galaxy. And I was like, it felt like a mother nurturing, like an empress energy uh, to it. She's like, oh, my goodness. My friend, my friend Sean has a theory on the Whirlpool galaxy. And I'll show you a picture of it here in a second. It's called M51. And um, he said that that's where you go before you go to heaven. Can't really see it all too well, but he said that he has a theory that's where you go right before you go to heaven, like maybe towards the light of the tunnel. I truly feel like maybe I was in the in-between and I was in that galaxy because they, you know, they got me to the hospital just in time to intubate me. So um, it was a beautiful energy, just absolutely beautiful But at the time when I come out of it, I thought I was going to hell because I tried to attempt suicide. And all I remember is seeing this red and orange. So I thought it was fire, like flames. And I couldn't make sense out of uh, of it at the time, but I was out of my mind too. (laughs) Um, But later on, I'm like, well, if that was hell, then why did it feel so good? You know? And and, and the more I've opened up to my spirituality, the more I started making more and more sense of it. So, but I, 
and I, and I thought more and more about it and I asked questions. Well, what was that orange? And then I get answers revealed to me. It's, you know, like gal, it's a galaxy, like center core, like galact, like the galactic core or the center of the universe. And um, yeah, it was it was truly truly amazing experience. I didn't get to see any beings or it's mostly just the feeling, just that feeling. Oh, I get it. Did you see your body? I did not see my body. I think I was in spirit form, like just everywhere, you know, like I said, everywhere all at once, but I was still identified with myself. Um, And when I woke up, when I come to, I was so mad. I didn't want to come back. And I said, what the F? I'm not supposed to be here. And um, I just remember passing back out. And um, so this was the actual same hospital I worked at. I just got fired from that hospital two days before. You and say so hired? Fired. Fired. I was fired. fired from that same hospital two days prior. And so I just remember going back to sleep and then I wake up and I'm on the same hospital floor I worked on. Oh and no. It was absolutely humiliating. Oh no, I bet. Most dear friends walked in the room and she was my nurse and it made it a little bit better, but um basically like in any time the doctors I was there, but not there, if that makes sense. So anytime the, t- the doctors would try to talk to me, like they would ask me a question, and I would start answering them back and forget what I was saying. It was the strangest thing. And they're like, she's not going to be able to talk to us. Like they ask a question and then I'll be like, what did you ask me again? It was the strangest thing. I don't, I don't know if it's just from the, the overdose or what it was, but it, and then I guess from when they intubated me, it tore up my mouth and my tongue. And so I could hard, I was having these like, like almost like zine pal sensations coming from there. It was the strangest thing. And it was like electric shocks on this right side of my mouth. And it'd be so painful. I couldn't even talk. So they're there. And I would get so anxious and there, they would be like, we need to give her something to calm down. So they started giving me Ativan. I don't know if you know anything about Ativan, but it's a, it's a heavy sedative. It's a lot like, um, it's a benzo. It's like Xanax, but in the IV basically. So anytime I'd wake up or anytime, uh, you know, I just didn't want to be awake. I, I had a sitter with me the whole time, seven days, full seven days, 24 hours a day because I was suicide watch. And so Every time I wake up, I tell my sitter, I'm like, go tell the nur- nurse I'm, I need my Ativan. And um, I call it the ride. We, as nurses, we call it the ride on the van, the Ativan. <laughs> uh-huh. but, uh, so, but I feel like that if me having the Ativan, I, I spent an entire week in the hospital, didn't even realize it. But um, that put me in that, that sedative, almost hip, hypnotizing state where I feel like, I was being healed at the same time from God. Um, I remember at times, point in times, I wake up from these, these full half body flails of the arms and legs. Like my leg would go straight up in the air sometimes. I'm like, I I wake up, I I wake up and I tell the sitter, I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, it just happens, you know? Um, And I was associate the right side of the body with um, future self or your masculine side or God. The father side and so I feel like maybe I was going through like extreme healing and um, transformation process while I was under that sedation um, and it was probably better I was under sedation because I didn't want to be surrounded all by all these co-workers that thought so low of me <clears throat> but I spent seven days in the hospital and so they go to discharge me and they asked me do you want to be discharged to the local state a mental facility or do you want to be, go to the ger- geriatric facility here in the hospital I'm like geriatric all the way I'll, I'll go to ger- geriatric no problem so on the way there <clears throat> um I was like so how many days was I in the hospital I was like what was it like two days and they're like no Jamie you're in the hospital for seven days I'm like what no way 
And so I get I get to the psych facility and I, I guess I start coming off the Ativan. I think it was the Ativan that kept me up the whole time. But um, I started waking up and then I realized things were coming to me I never knew before. Like all the pieces of the puzzle that I was having a lot of like mixed feelings about or just really confused about going on in my life. It was all like downpouring on me. Like all the pieces were coming together. And I, and even though all those pieces were coming together, I still knew I had a, a drug addiction problem. I still knew I was going to get back out and use. Um, so I'll kind of give you a background on that. So I, I had some issues with substance abuse with first, it was opiates. I went into these, uh, the Board of Nursing's uh, peer assistance program for substance abuse. And so I was in that program for three years. I was sober for almost all, all two years because I relapsed the first year and went to rehab, got out. And then I was sober another two years when I relapsed this last that last time. And um, what happened was I got involved with this new guy that was supposedly sober and he happened to been using and I didn't realize it. And he brought, he, he had already been like abusing me. He was a narcissist. I'm a highly sensitive empath. So you know how that goes with narcissists. And I let him in my heart and I, and, and he, he was very abusive and COVID hit. This is in April, 2020. And they already stopped drug testing because they didn't want us to go into any of the facilities for drug testing. So I'm like, he's already like, I was already having some self-worth issues before, but he just put me on the bottom and I was like, I might as well. And I used drugs with them. I was uh, IV drug using meth. I'd never done that before in my life. And I was using it recreationally. I only used it three or four times before my job started noticing like some behavior changes. And um, anybody that knows about IV meth use, you can tell almost instantaneously there's a change in your psych and or change in your behaviors, change in a lot of things. <laughs> so they picked up right away. And the boyfriend I had at the time was already giving me issues. So he called up to my work, um, told them what I was doing, and they fired me for for that. And I don't blame them. Um, there were some things that were said to me when they fired me that was very hurtful. Um, I had one of the supervisors tell me that I asked for it. And I don't care what anybody's done. <laughs> Nobody asked to be in an abusive relationship. And I tried to explain to her, I was like, you know what, as a nurse, you know the abuse cycle. Um, you know what it's like. And she's like, well, you asked for it. And it just, and then I wasn't even acting all right. Then they started acting like, oh, they're going to escort me out and this and that. I wasn't even giving them any issues. I was just trying to speak my side, but. Oh, you were at work when he called and told this. Yes. And so. Did they drug test you or you just went ahead and admitted? No, I just went ahead and admitted. I can't, I can't lie. <laughs> but um, so I knew. With me getting fired from that job, that was going to put me out of compliance with the Board of Nursing with the peer assistance program. So I already knew, I thought, assumed I was going to lose my nursing license. Um, which I would, I knew I was going to be out of nursing anyways, either way, because they would have sent me to rehab and all, you know, that whole works. But I just went home that day and just felt really really bad about my life because I didn't have it together um, mentally, physically, um, emotionally at all. I had no stability in my life. And I went through a lot of trauma with this guy. I had a gun pointed to my head, knife to my neck. He maced me. He, he was, he, I'm not going to say he's horrible, but he tried, he did teach me a very valuable lesson, how to love myself and put myself first. But um, it was very traumatic. And I just knew that I was going to lose my house, lose my kids, already lost my career. And I just woke up that one of those days, that day, that day of, I was like, I'm going to kill myself today. I don't know where it came from. I do feel that I may have been possessed by some kind of outside entity. 
But that's because that's not something I normally would have done. And I researched all day that day how I was going to kill myself. Um, I would have hung myself if I would have found something, to, but I couldn't find anything. So thank goodness I didn't go to that resort. But yeah, is I think what's most traumatic is being at the hospital on the same floor I worked on. <laughs> what did they say about the mount you took? I mean, they said that, you- yeah, they said that what would have killed me is the anticholinergic poisoning from the Benadryl. And what it did, it did reverse to me. You would think that it would make you drowsy and, and put you out, but it didn't. I was acting like almost in psychosis and couldn't control my my body movements. They said, I actually talked to one of the um, paramedics uh, last year. And she's like, Jamie, you broke a whole shelf off the side of the ambulance. So I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't even remember it. She's like, it does the reverse to you. And so they said I was just, like, they couldn't even get me strapped down on the stretcher because I was just wow. all over the place. I don't remember any of it though. Strangest thing. But while I've stayed another week in the psychiatric facility and I think I've been there five or six days and I, I, I've never had a dream like this before. Um, and I haven't since, um, I had a dream. I was at the psychiatric floor, which it was like on the third or fourth floor. And then I, I had a dream that I wasn't, my bed wasn't in the room. This is strange. There was glass siding, sliding doors, and they put my bed outside and closed the doors and left me outside on the lawn. <laughs> so I wake up from my dream within the dream. And so I walk through the sliding glass doors and I don't see any of the nurses or the nurses station. So I start walking down the hall. And as I'm walking by these rooms, there's girls getting pressed up and pretty and ready to go somewhere. And I keep going, walking down the hall and I get to the end of the hall and there's like this uh, big um, staircase that goes down to this pool area. And it's all elegant, like gold and chandeliers, and it's it's all blitzed out. <clears throat> and as soon as I get down, it was people were drinking and partying. And as soon as I get down there, I remember seeing seeing two naked guys peeing on each other. It was so strange. Um, and then I seen this Medusa looking lady. She looked like I dream a genie, but green, she had green on. She's like, "Come, come, come with us." And I'm like. I don't know about this. <laughs> and so, and then this hippie guy approaches me, kind of reminds me of Matthew McConaughey on uh, Dazed and Confused. He's like, hey, what's going on? And you're like, come to the party? I'm like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if I like this party scene, you know. He's like, come over here. And so we go next door and it's like a church congregation, but it's dark. It's like dark velvet lining on the walls like you would see at a movie theater and there's a dark wood pulpit you know it was very dark I didn't get any good vibes from it and so I gotta get out of here (laughs) so there was like this banister but it wasn't stairs it was just plain flat wood because I for some reason I couldn't go back to the pool area so I decided to go up the little spiral banister and I get to the top and I seen it I seen a picture of Satan I'm like oh my gosh, like, and I don't remember what was said to me or what made me mad, but I threw this picture of Satan and I'm like, F you Satan. And I throw it and it hits a guy and beheads him. This is the strangest dream, but (laughs) it's the the most lucid dream I've ever had in my life. But it was my battle. It was my battle. It was my spiritual battle. Um, And so the hippie guy looks at me, he's like, Oh, you shouldn't have done that. You you should look into the book of Abernathy or Aberdeen or something like that. Like Satan has his own Bible or something. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a very, very strange dream. Um, but I won my battle. I'm like, I love Jesus. Jesus is who I love. This isn't for me. And I got out of there. And it's been a long, hard battle since. But Jesus has always carried me through it all. <laughs> He's so amazing. Even though he wasn't there, he was there. He pulled me out of that. Um, 
I think when, and when I woke up that morning, it was like a weight had been lifted off of me because I chose Jesus. The whole, there was a whole shift in me. Um, and so, and I think it was the very next morning was Sunday morning. I'm like, I'm going to get up early and watch church on TV. So I got up like at four or five o'clock in the morning It didn't start till seven, I think, but I was just watching what was on TV. And sure enough, it has an episode. It's on the, one of, I think the 700 club channel. It was, had an episode talking about the lady with the snake head. <laughs> I, 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 how is this, like, how does that happen? What a coincidence there. Like, wow, that's strange. But it was like, it was just a good reminder to know that I took the right path. You know, it could have been a whole lot worse going down that path, but I made that choice within that lucid dream. And that's what changed my life when I chose Jesus. So I've always loved Jesus. I was saved when I was 11 years old. And um, I used to just go out and minister to everybody about Jesus, how much I love Jesus. And I, and I have a, I don't know, I can't even, I have such an incredible love for Jesus. Um, I asked him to be with me right now. He's right behind me with his hands on my shoulders. <laughs> We have a very close personal relationship now, and um, I can't see him, but I know when he's with me, and uh, he's carried me through it all. I've had a very rough life. Um, I grew up with a drug addict, uh, alcoholic mother, um, and I had two younger brothers, uh, Chase. He's a couple, like three years younger than me, and then there was Cole, and he was five years younger than me. And she was, I wouldn't say neglectful all the time, but I had to step in quite a bit, especially when Cole, after Cole was born, I was changing diapers and feeding him, feeding him bottles at the age of five and could get him out of his crib. And uh, my mom asked me, she's like, I remember you getting Cole out of his crib, but how'd you do? I was like, I climb in there, climb halfway out, grab a hole of him, and then, phew, and that's how <laughs> I would get him out. I, I don't know. <laughs> I was forced to grow up really fast <laughs> and I was an indigo child. I think me being an indigo child is what got me through all those rough times because I was able to step out of this physical realm and be in a place of fantasy and childlike wonder and just be happy and free. Um, I used to get in trouble all the time at school for daydreaming. I <laughs> <laughs> I had to always catch myself up on math because I'd be daydreaming and like, oh, oh gosh, I gotta hurry up and finish my paper. <laughs> but I was the I same way. I spent a lot of time running outside barefooted on the ground, even on gravel, everything. <laughs> Riding horses and I had I had a really good time outside. I cannot complain. I grew up on a ranch. It was very, it was very nice. <laughs> And my, my stepdad, he would always say, I was like, young, I don't remember this part. I was like two or three. I'd just be looking outside the window and he'd be like, you want to go outside and play? I'd be like, yeah. Like I've just been waiting for him to let me go outside. <laughs> so mother earth has been a very good friend of mine as well. She's been very nurturing to me and helped carry me through a lot as well. Um, I'm just going to try. And then as we're growing up, uh, Cole, Cole's, Cole's uh, 19. He, he just grad, graduated high school, started a new job. He's the one I was took care of. He's like, he's my baby, baby brother. That is my baby. <laughs> um, he took off to go work in Louisiana when the Hurricane Katrina had hit to go clean up on the spill and, and uh, do all that. And um, he was supposed to come home uh, Friday. Um, and he didn't, they all went out Thursday night and went partying and he drank, he drank a little too much and took too many pills, they said, and he passed away. And that's when my world shattered. Oh, and that was when I was 24 or 25. And before 25, I didn't have any issues. Um, I was very ambitious. I finished nursing school with a two-year-old girl, got my bachelor's in nursing. I mean, I had my whole life ahead of me. And when he passed away, it shattered me. And um, 
so I started resorting to partying um, and then uh, very unhealthy coping me mechanisms. I was already kind of like, you know, already attracting the narcissist. That, that part was already happening, but it got way worse. It got so much worse. I was partying. I was picking up these guys that were just, I was codependent. I wanted somebody that wanted to be dependent on me. And so I was getting getting in all these bad relationships and drinking and, and, and popping pills and stuff like that. It was just, I would, I would do that for a little while. I clean up for a year or two, but I, I'd go right back out. I never could find a way to deal with the grief of my brother. And then after my brother passed, my mother got way worse, way worse. And so she was with my codependency issues. I always took care of my mother and it got way worse. It got so out of hand. And, but I tried to make the best of it. Um, and then she passed away in 2018. This was um, a year, year and a half before I, that, that happened. I, and I feel like we had, I had like a trauma bond with her. And then you, I, I'd seen uh, one of your episodes earlier about a lady who had RAD. Uh -huh. But maybe, maybe it was partially that too. I don't know, but I had a trauma bond with her. So after she passed away, even though that toxicity was taking out of my life, I couldn't deal with it, her being gone. It was, and, and it's like when she passed away, I couldn't, like, I didn't cry. I wasn't sad. It wasn't until like that year and a half later, it's boom, hit me. And it was wild. I, <laughs> I look back and I'm like, I don't know how I made it through all that. But now that I've, I've become, I've had that divine union within and now that I've seen all that hardship and everything I've been through was all for divinely orchestrated by God so that I could have this divine union within myself and have a closer relationship with him and have, have a personal relationship with Jesus. And I'm grateful for it all now. I know a lot of people don't say that when they've had so much trauma and hurt and pain in their life. And I want to help teach others it is possible. Um, I, I have, uh, it's been revealed to me that I am to, I, I am a big lover of the threefold flame. <laughs> I feel like I am to help activate other people's upper heart chakra. Um, so that that way they can come from a place of non-duality, non-judgment, and just come from a place of love and and truly see and feel and experience what his divine love is. And a friend of mine used a really good word the other day, omnilove, like omnipresence, omnipotence, omnilove. And I want to help light people up because I truly feel like when I was in that in-between or wherever I may have been, that there was some sparklet in me and I'm, I'm supposed to share that spark with others. And maybe I can spark somebody else's heart the way you spark mine. So I truly feel like I'm here to help help others with their process and their, and their pain and sufferings. I'm curious, what did your mom die of? She, not really sure. They uh, ruled it to be overdose. Strong, strong, strong history of drug use on my mother's side of the family alcohol and, and drug use, all of them almost. How was your other brother doing? He was just got out of the hospital last week for alcoholism. Um, he's doing okay right now. I think he's really determined this time to stay, stay dry and, st and, and try to make something of his life. So, and what's Excuse really me. strange, that same week mm -hmm. I almost passed away, the very next week he almost died. We were both in the hospital at the same time. It was the strangest thing. <laughs> he, what had happened with him, he'd been drinking so much alcohol. It basically took all the lining out of his stomach and he wasn't able to uh, 
keep anything down. So he was so critically low in potassium and magnesium. He was in a heart rhythmia that they said that he could have flatlined at any time. But yeah, he's, he's doing better, but not quite where I'd like to see him anyways. Were you able to get your nursing license back? Well, they put it on hot for five years. So um, it's been two and a half years. So in two and a half more years, I'll be able to go back. I miss so what it. Do you so do? What do you do now? Right now, I'm just working little side jobs. I work at a tanning salon and Victoria's Secret. <laughs> I would say I'm an angel and I spread light. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll be able to get your license in two and a half years and get back on track. Yeah, that's good. I I think they're going to be so pleased to, to hear my experience the last few years. <laughs> have you seen Hillbilly Elegy? I have not. No, have I you heard of it? it? Yes, okay. I have watched it. It's been a few. It's been probably three or four years. I need to go back and watch that movie again. Your that's story's funny. making me think of that. Yep. Yeah, you know, the mom was a nurse and she lost her license, her drug problem. And it's the exact same thing, but just about. <laughs> and she thought that she had, her mom was a dysfunctional family member. It was her dad, I think, wasn't it? Was her dad the dysfunctional? I think family? it was her mom and her dad because the her mom set the dad on fire. It's pretty dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> it is dysfunctional. <laughs> Although he credits, you know, his grandmother for saving his life, you know, yeah. getting him to where he is now to have a, a security That's, there. It's so weird. Like my mom and my grandma and my grandma favored me quite a bit. I always thought very highly of her. She put me on a pedestal and, and made me feel loved and accepted. My mom, on the other hand, did not like my grandma. But me with my mom, it's the same relationship with me and my mom. And then my daughter and, and my mom had a very, very close relationship. And it's like the same family pattern. I'm starting huh. to, once you start seeing all the patterns and cycles, you're like, oh, you get, become aware of it. Then you're like, oh, now I can, now I know what to do to fix it. Or, <laughs> but I got everything given back to me that I, that I dished out to my mother. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to me. <laughs> Full cycle. <laughs> How old is your daughter now? She's 20. Oh, okay. You just had the one child? I have four. I have a 15 okay. year old boy, Cooper, and then that's Macy, my 20 year old, and then a 12 year old boy, Cade, and then a six year old boy, Trevor. <laughs> and my two youngest boys are my, um, my six year old is my crystal child. And my 12-year-old is my indigo child. What's that mean, your crystal child? Um, just that uh, I'm trying to, they just naturally have that omnipresence to them, like almost like an angelic. They have okay. that, that, the crystal structure to them, I guess. I was going to show you. So my friend Jessica that had mentioned that galaxy said the same guy that mentioned the theory about that galaxy actually went to that gal galaxy i don't know if it's recently you know out of body or you know uh astral production and this is what he's seen let's see if i'm pointing it where you can see it again it's a cross oh. that so oh. when he in that same galaxy again he was he's seen that eye with the cross in it he I does astral that. projection uh-huh yeah since um i've uh, activated my upper heart chakra uh which i i now that i know what it is my merkabas have always been in play, like going i was astral projecting when i was a kid when i was in the classroom i remember doing that but i'm able to go through galaxies and um stargates and uh go with places i've never been before in the last two weeks my life has just phew, rocketed um and I've had a teacher that's been helping me along with this. She, she said all these new, these indigo children that are coming into their roles, they're being skyrocketed right now. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I feel, I've, there's some days my Merkaba is going so fast. 
it's like I can't even get comfortable. I'm just constantly just like vibrating. <laughs> but I feel like I'm here also to help raise the frequency and to help because um, I do a lot of grid work and um, I'm learning more and more about the process because I feel like we're weavers. We're like a weaver, like of a big network because just like Wi-Fi, even though you don't see the signal, the signal's there. And I feel like we all signal off of each other and we're dream weaving this big web of this new earth that, uh, and birthing it into creation. And it's us that are making it happen. And with the planetary grid work, it's like once you um, anchor it down to Mother Earth, it's accessible for others to have like Akashic records, I guess you could say. Like, so they have um, access to that information as well. So I, I do a lot of, spend a lot of time doing that too. I would say I might be a little obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be well, obsessed. we have an addictive personality. So you find something you enjoy that makes you happy to be addicted on, I suppose. Yeah. you know. That would, so how is the addiction going? Um, I've been clean over a year now. I did. Oh, this is another story I was going to tell you about. Um. So February of last year, of 2021, I had a relapse again in January, and it got the best of me. I, I relapsed on meth, and it got the best of me. All that darkness that was there before came back, um, and I was seeing demons, and I I had my spirit, spiritual awakening in December 2021. Um, or 2020, I'm sorry. And I thought I was going crazy. And so I, I, um, turned to drugs and then it just made me, even, it was not a good experience, but what happened was I was having these, I had a minor heart attack and I was right back in the hospital again. And I would, it was, I can honestly say that situation made me not scared of anything at all. Like I'm already not scared to die, but now I'm definitely not scared of no demons. I had to fight off two demons uh, and I did it on my own. Uh, I prayed a lot and I asked for Jesus and uh, just, it, it was quite the experience, <laughs> but I was able to get th through that as well. I, I, I call it my dark night of the soul. I had to go through some very extensive dark times. Um, and I and I dove in and went as deep as I could because I didn't want to face any of those obstacles again. And I can honestly say that I'm not scared of anything now. There's nothing I'm scared of because I know nothing has no hold over me. As long as I have the power and love of Jesus and God and uh, there's nothing, you, there's nothing that can... No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Uh, and so I just want to help spread that, my story, so that maybe my experience, strength, and hope can help others to have the same hope that there's nothing to be scared of. Nothing has authority over you unless you let it, you know? And and sometimes those demons that we face are our own inner demons and that it's like the law of correspondence. What happens internally reflects externally. Sometimes those demons are our own demons. And sometimes we have to face them and take it head on and, and face it. Oh, there's a quote I wanted to read to you that really reminds me of this. <clears throat> it's from that movie, Eat, Pray, Love with Julia Roberts. Okay. It's called The Rule of Quest Physics. If, you, if you're brave enough to leave all familiar and comforting on a true a truth seeking journey internally or externally and if you are truly willing to regard everything that happens to you as a clue and if you accept everyone along the way as a teacher and if you are prepared to face and forgive some very difficult realities about yourself then the truth will not be withheld from you and i can't help to believe this given my experience it's even though the darkness, I went into the darkness and I, it was a very scary, it, it was a very scary place, you know, and because I was able to face that darkness, I was able to find my light. 
And all darkness is, is really just lack of information. And I really feel like maybe I can help others um, with their darkness, you know, and help them face it so they don't have to face it alone. Um, I've actually had a friend of mine, he lives, he lives locally around here within an hour away, but he met me one day and we went out to the lake. Uh, there's a wildlife refuge not too far from here. We met at the lake and he laid hands on, on me and prayed for me. And he healed me after that day. There's been, it's, and that was probably about four or five months after the heart attack incident. And he took something, he took off, off of me. Um, I could feel it. I, my whole body started shaking and I had to grab a hold of the fence next to me just to keep from falling to my knees. But when he laid hands on me, he, it was like Jesus touched me, literally touched me in the physical. And I told him, I was like, are you Jesus? Like, he's like, I am. He's like, I I'm someone that works for Jesus. And if it wasn't for him and I have a friend, named, another friend of Jessica that that's helped me tremendously with Reiki. And um, I had a quantum healing a hypnotherapy se session back in March that helped me a lot too with healing. If it wasn't for all this healing, I wouldn't be where I'm at today without people in my soul family that has helped me along the way. It's truly just magnificent to me how God just aligns the right people in your in your life at the right time. And just like you, <laughs> this, this is truly magical and all the synchronicities. Um, there's never a day that goes by. I don't get, get to see at least one synchronicity. And it's just, and I feel, I, I feel things I've never been able to feel before. I can feel when the angels come swarming in my house. I can hear it. I can see it. Not not so much see it. I can see energy. Um, but it's just amazing to me how magical it is. <laughs> it really is. And I can't get enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a high. The whole, you know, when you've had NDE and, and you focus on the spiritual side, it can, and you really got focused to stay there in that happy place and, yeah. I mean, life gets us all down, but if we can get back there and, and like you said, there's nothing to be afraid of when we realize that. I I used to battle a lot with self-sabotaging and just really like negative self-talk, but re really helped me. Um, oh, so after I had the near death experience, I went back out for a, a four months and um, I was, I've never been, I've never lived the street life. I didn't know what street life people were like. And so I was letting all these people in my house and they're robbing me, stealing from me, yeah, just pilfering. And oh, it, was it was a horrible lifestyle. And I just sat in my room for four months straight, just all to myself. That was part of my dark, dark night of the soul, too. But I I decided I didn't want that life anymore. Um, I, this guy had beat me at one point in time. I had both my eyes black for like a couple of weeks. It, he he. That's when I realized I'm like, I really don't want this life anymore. And um, so I and and the cops started watching my house. I knew how to get out of that. I had to get out. And so I finally went to rehab. And there's this book that my grandma always, I wonder if I have it close by. Anyways, there's this book that my grandma always had that kind of mesmerized me. I'm like, okay, I'll just pack that book and take it with me to rehab. And I'll read it when I'm at rehab. It's called Power of the Subconscious Mind by Joseph Murphy. And I started saying this prayer every day at rehab. I had nothing to lose. I hadn't I had nowhere to go. I had I had no friends. My family had all have been done with me. And um, I'm like, I might as well just say this prayer. Just see, you know, there, what's it going to hurt? And so I started saying this prayer. I'll say it real quick. The divine leads and guides me in all my ways. Perfect health is mine, and the law of harmony operates in my mind and body. Beauty, love, peace, and abundance are mine. The principle of right action and divine order govern my entire life. I know my major premise is based on the eternal truth of life, and I know, feel, and believe that my subconscious mind responds to my conscious mind thinking. And that prayer changed my life. <laughs> 
I didn't know how dramatically it was going to change my life, but it did. It's just, it's amazing when you open your subconscious mind to the universe, what it will reciprocate to you. All you got to do is ask. So I tell people all the time, all you got to do is ask. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> Did you ever find you Mr. Right? No. No. I'm almost to the point where I just really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like being to myself now. I just, I think after being in all those reckless, toxic relationships, I'm just like, I'm okay by myself. <laughs> do you have a support system? Do you have friends or anybody that helps you out? No. Really, I don't have a lot of friends because our family think I'm crazy because I'm spiritual and they don't agree with my new beliefs. And not that they they don't want me around. I'll go to family functions and stuff like that, but they they're not too supportive. My dad loves me. If it wasn't for my dad, I wouldn't know what love is. Honestly, like without my mother, my, my mom, she didn't show any love. So. I'm very grateful I had a dad that showed me what love was. And does he help you with the kids? I don't see him, but maybe every oh. month if that. And I don't have hardly any friends here too, but I have plenty of friends online. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need. <laughs> so when you were homeless and stuff, where was the kids at? I was curious. I went to their dads. When all that went down, I made sure they were all taken care of and they went to their dads and um my two middle boys have a different dad than my youngest boy. So my youngest boy went to his dad's. He's here in town. I get him half time now. And then my two middle boys, I get them at least every other weekend. So um, it's been hard, but it's been it's been nice to have time to myself. I could focus on myself and heal. And um, therefore, and I've noticed, too, anytime I heal and I, I do things and work on myself, it's like a snowball. It snowballs down. Like whatever I do affects them. And so it heals them as well. So it's it's like, wow, I should have done that a long time ago. <laughs> you think it was your mom's influence that got you and your brother and yeah. brothers in this? Yeah. Um, and I, I truly feel, I, I believe in, um, and uh ancestry karma karma like where they call it generational curses oh okay and the trauma from the from the carrying it down through the through the ages i guess but i i truly feel like there's some generational curses going on there it's very dysfunctional family i'm the first one to break out of it and i have one other cousin as well so, oh so it's like full family-wide Oh, oh, yeah. That's all your mom's siblings and parents. Uh, yeah. My, my, her mom and dad were pretty functional. They were both alcoholics though, but they were functional. Um, her, my grandma, the rest of her brothers and sisters, except for one, all were pretty bad alcoholics. Um, yeah. And almost all my mom's cousins were, yeah, they're almost all alcoholics or drug addicts so is that we have a family reunion stuff is that what it mostly is drinking <laughs> oh like they don't have it okay yeah i don't, I I don't family see. they're a bunch of drinkers and like every family reunion all oh, they get together it was always just drinking yeah. drinking when i was younger <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was never a dull moment <laughs> And then my dad is, it's, I got the best of both worlds. So on my dad's side of the family, they're very Christian and straight laced, uh, Baptist, Southern Baptist. Um, so yeah, they're and just very, very loving, you know, and supportive. Um, I think they just at their wits in with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I understand. I understand. You know, it's okay. Do they see you've changed? Yeah, but they still don't say that. I don't know. They don't really talk to me. <laughs> but I I pray that we do have a better relationship soon. I feel it. I feel like it's 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 in it's in the works. I feel like God's pushing. It takes time to yeah. build trust again. Yeah, it's just gonna take some time. 
It really is. I really hurt them, especially with the whole suicide attempt. I think that really shot them through the heart, you know? And I, I, yeah. I, I understand that would be really, really hard. And I feel like me with my suicide attempt that it was all, it was, it was a learning experience. Um, I learned from my experience that you don't go to hell when you die. If, even if you try to commit suicide, cause I grew up thinking if you commit a suicide, you go to hell. And I know now from my given experience that you don't go to hell. And if that's some kind of reassurance to some people uh, that have, has had family members or friends that's passed away from a suicide, I hope maybe that can give them some reassurance that, no, it's not true. Um, I feel like there's, there is a, um, a learning once they cross over, they have to go through a learning process to become a spiritual being, just like I am now in the physical form, me becoming a spiritual being. So that way I can go to heaven. And I feel like in heaven too, they have to go through a learning, like a school to, to become a spiritual being so that they can reach those realms of heaven. I don't believe there is a hell though. I really don't. Not from my what do you think that was all about with the demons, devils, you know, the it was my own my own shadows. It was my own shadows. I really do. I feel like that's something and it I mean it was a really hard way of having to face my shadows, but me being as stubborn as I am, <laughs> that's what it took. <laughs> you know, the universe loves the stubborn spirit. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, I, mean, I, have to speak myself. <laughs> I don't want to go back to any of that. <laughs> but yeah, I'm a, I am very hard headed. You know, um, my and, and growing up, my dad's like, just leave your mom alone. Don't mess with her. You know, she's bad influence. And I, I wouldn't listen to him, you know, and I just um, go off and still have a, try to have a relationship with my mother anyways, even though she was toxic. And it's just, I have very unhealthy coping mechanisms. Very, very. And I can see why my dad got so frustrated with me. Because <laughs> it could, I mean, I could imagine it would be frustrating. And from what, I, from what I've heard, that meth is really hard to get off of. Is that right? It is super hard to get off of. Um, when I first went to rehab, they had to send me to the hospital. I was detoxing so bad. I, I always thought that you didn't detox from meth. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> I was detoxing so bad. I was like almost having convulsions. I was having like those zaps again. The, it, it's like these zaps would go through my head. It was like an instant headache, and throb, zaps, just these electrical zaps going through me. And it it was very, ugh, yeah. So I ended up going to the hospital and stayed another, stayed another week in the nut hut. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I try me being the person I I try to make the best of everything. Even when I am down, I try still try to make the best of everything. I mean, I tell people all the time now, like, what one of these days you're gonna wake up from this dream and wonder why you took took it so serious? Because uh, I feel like we right now at this point in time that we really need to focus on uh, return the return is the return to innocence. Uh, becoming that childlike kid again and seeing seeing through the eyes of a child again and just being playful and just that's where I'm at right now <laughs> I'm like a little kid again and I love it because you know yeah. Jesus talks I think it talks about in the Bible too about Jesus childlike uh, faith heart uh, the faith of a child is the strongest faith you'll ever find and so you take down all those bells and all those belief systems and just every, you take all that away and you get to the core of yourself, to your inner child again, and just live in pure joy and ecstasy and, and just being caught in the moment and, and living in the now. It's just, it's incredible to me. And um, I really believe that we're supposed to return to children again. We need to be a bunch of big kids running around and yeah. Around. <laughs> yeah and the way kids just go up to other kids and just hug them and love them and make friends with everybody where us adults we're just 
like, you know, got these walls up everywhere. <laughs> we think the worst one and and expect the worst of everything. <laughs> I had to, I, you know, stuff going on in the news. It's got everybody on the on edge and expecting the worst. Yeah, that's why I try not to watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> the other day, we had, my daughter was with me. We're in the, we're in the drive through McDonald's, and this guy, you know, there's two lanes. You go take turns getting in back in line. Well, this guy hurried up and cut in front of us, and my daughter is like so mad. And I was kind of mad for a second. I'm like, that jerk. And I'm like, oh, I had to go back to Heart Center. My like, Heart Center, Damon Heart Center. That, <laughs> but so I still act, uh, still react sometimes. I got to catch myself. I was like, well, maybe he's not in front of us and maybe he'll pay for our food. Maybe he'll, you know, pay it forward or something. And he didn't. But I took a picture of his license plate. I'm like, obviously he got in front of us for a reason. And that maybe that reason is for us to see his license plate. He didn't pay for our food. So, but the license plate uh, was said 1124 on it. And it said something about keep going your you know your angels are with you and you're on the right track it's something we both needed to hear that day and I was like see it served a purpose you don't even have to get mad at him no more <laughs> <laughs> my husband gets mad about things like that too getting cut off in line it's like I'll just sit here a little longer I don't care <laughs> most of the time I don't either but I guess me seeing my daughter's reaction that made me react I was like oh I'm a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> So, was there anything else you'd like to add? Not that I can think of. Um, I just focus on healing. I just, I just really need to focus on healing, and um, so I can heal or help heal others. I'm not the best speaker. I mumbo, mumbo jumbo a little bit, but great. <laughs> you did great. You're hilarious. Checked, <laughs> and you're just laughing all the way through it. <laughs> I Way when I was in high school, I would go to school and I would tell these awful things that was going on at home and people would be laughing. But then sometimes somebody would be like, well, that's just awful. And that's horrible. And I'm like, what do you want me to cry about it? Because I could just laugh about it, you know, so crying about it's not going to do anything. So might as well, like my, my sister's mentally ill and she would do these weird things and I would just tell the stuff she was doing. And this one girl <laughs> thought that was mean. I'm like, I can't. Seriously, I've got to make a joke about it because, I'll, you know, I'll just get all depressed and everything. So <laughs> I had a doctor come in. This is I actually worked postpartum at the time, but I just delivered my 12 year, 12 year old and my blood count was low. He come in and is like, yeah, you're as white as that sheet. Your hemoglobin was da, 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 da. And I was like, <laughs> I was laughing. That way he likes it. Everything he laughs constantly. Sometimes he comes to bed laughing. I'm like, don't wake me up. <laughs> so just, gosh, he just laughs at everything all the time. This sounds about like me. <laughs> just laugh it so, off. It's the best yes. <laughs> it helps actually. You know, if you're feeling bad, just start laughing about something. You actually feel better. You don't even know why. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And um, had me on. I hope, I hope this video is ready. I look forward to reading your book. I, I'm ready. I haven't got a chance to sit down and read it, but I look forward to reading it. Hear about your experience. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping it's going to change some laws. Um, because uh, first half child abuse, and then it goes on where I was a child abuse investigator, and I uncovered a lot of corruption and things. Oh, and I'm wow. hoping that I'm at the point now that I might be able to get some laws changed. Wow. We'll see. I'm holding my breath here. Yeah. I'll be, I'll so. be holding. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Much Bye. love.